Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this site event on our COP27 titled No Mine, No Climate Transition, a conversation on the raw materials challenge. This event is hosted by LKAB, one of the main uh, Swedish mining companies with a track record of being a sustainable front runner. My name is Anna Gumbau, I am a climate and energy journalist and I'll be your moderator in this discussion. Today we are discussing a crucial topic for Europe's energy transition under the context of COP27. This is Europe's critical raw material dependence and how we can reduce it. The European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen recently said in her State of the European Union address that, I read, lithium and rare earths are already replacing gas and oil at the heart of our economy and we have to avoid falling into the same dependency as with oil and gas. It is clear that if we want to achieve the objectives under the European Green Deal, we need to find ways to reduce our dependence on critical raw materials. For this reason, the European Commission is, presenting, is preparing an EU critical raw materials strategy, which can help us achieve these goals and strengthen the resilience of our supply chains. Today we will be hearing about some also very innovative projects to tackle this issue, such as the REMAP project of LKAB, which aims at securing an important supply of critical raw materials, all by doing so in a sustainable and circular way. REMAP has a true potential to be considered a strategic project on critical raw materials, and it has the potential to address these identified problems and be a part of the solution, doing so in a sustainable manner. You will be a a very important part on this uh, discussion today because we will be also having your participation throughout this discussion. We're going to be using a Slido, we're going to have a poll uh, where we would like to ask you a question uh, in the middle of our discussion and you will also be able to ask questions yourself to our panelists which we'll be able to address in uh, the few minutes that we have at the end of the discussion for some uh, Q&A. So, Make sure to uh, have your devices ready and to ask any questions that you would like to ask our panelists. So let's get it started. I'm delighted to introduce the panelists to, of our session today. Uh, with us here in the studio is uh, David Höcknelitz. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for Business Area Special Products at LKAB. David, thanks for being with us. Also, uh, with us on my other side is David Pennington, a portfolio leader for strategic value chains, secure and sustainable raw materials at the European Commission. Thanks a lot for being with us. Good morning. And joining us online is uh, Kari Herlevi, the head of unit for global affairs at CITRA, the Finnish Innovation Fund. Mr. Herlevi, thanks for being with us. Well, before, uh, before we kick off with our discussion, we have a little video where um, we will be get, get to see a little bit uh, some of the topics that brings us together today and how a project is uh, putting uh, these ideas in practice on the REMAP project. So if I can have the video, please. Jag har inte upplevt ett större industriellt projekt under alla mina år som ledande, får man väl säga, svensk beslutsfattare. Det här är det särklassets största. Och det är drivet av en insikt om att om vi inte gör det så kommer efter oss ett samhälle att växa fram som blir allt svårare för våra barn och barnbarn att leva i. Det är klimatfrågan det handlar om. Här har vi en avgörande industriell insats baserat på basindustrin syftande till att också i framtiden använda stål i samhällsbygget. En enorm betydelse för klimatet. Vi gör det och vi kommer att tjäna pengar på det. Vi kommer att starta nya anläggningar. Vi kommer att skapa nya jobb. Vi kommer att bygga nya städer. Vi kommer att behöva ha nära relationer med de människor som ska bära det här projektet framåt. Den här klimatutmaningen vi har och den insats som Norrbotten kan göra i det sammanhanget, det har global betydelse. Vi kommer under hela den här resan med det fysiska samhällsbygget att av och till utsättas för olika typer av påfrestningar och konflikter. Det är naturligt. 
De ska vi ta naturligtvis och reda ut. Men det får inte stoppa projektet. Utan vårt uppdrag, vår uppgift är att se till så att detta fullföljs. Välkommen till Norrbotten. Här finns jobben. Här finns de svåra och utmanande jobben. Här finns framtiden. Right, so let's get this discussion started after seeing this video. And I have with me uh, David from LKAB. Uh, why don't you get us started? What can you tell us about the REMAP project and which opportunities does it open for the green transition? Thank you, Anna. Well, it opens a lot of opportunities as we aim to produce critical raw materials from mine waste. And that's what I thought I'd present to you here today to get the discussion started. LKB is based in northern Sweden. We've been operating since 1890 uh, and uh, we produce around 80% of the iron ore in the EU, 27 million tons annually. We have three mine sites and, and operate the world's largest underground iron ore mines. We transport the iron ore through the uh, railway with electrified uh, locomotives to our ports in Narvik and Luleå. And what we see is that as a mining and minerals company, uh, our uh, possibility to develop our operations in the future rely on our mineral resources and reserves. We have explored and identified more than 4 billion tons of mineral resources and reserves, iron, phosphorus and rare earth elements. As I said, we're operating underground iron ore mines, so to be able to extract this financially, technically, we need to establish a new world standard for mining at great depths. That will be digitalized, autonomous and carbon dioxide free. That is the first step in our transformation. The second step is relating to our products, the iron ore products. Today we produce iron ore pellets, which has a much lower climate impact than uh, com comparative products. And it also allows a very high efficiency for our customers, the steel makers, in their blast furnace process. However, blast furnaces are uh, using coal, so creating a lot of CO2 emissions. So our strategy going forward is to take another step in the value chain and to produce sponge iron with hydrogen technology. That has the potential to reduce CO2 emissions in our value chain for our customers and ourselves with 40 to 50 million tons of CO2 annually. As we're doing these two activities, we're putting in place long-term potentials beyond 2060 for our operations, which will also allow us to now plant for technical uh, and financial investments in extracting the critical raw materials that also exist in our ores, but are separated at the end of the processing because we are now producing a high quality iron ore product. It's a product, um, a mineralization called Appetite. It's a phosphorus mineral that also has fluorine and our ease. And why is phosphorus important, you might ask? Well, mineral fertilizers are made up of different nutrients, whereas phosphorus is one of the main ones. Europe is import dependent for 90% of our phosphorus, and mineral fertilizers enable 50% of world food production. With the, the recent events and with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a quarter of Europe's supply has disappeared. And Europe is trying to find new uh, sources for this. But given the situation, it's caused a, a soaring price and a decreased availability, which is bad for our farming and agriculture industry. If you look at rare earths, the situation is actually even worse. We have no extraction in Europe, zero, and very marginal refinement. And here it is China that dominates the market. And they have for a long time dominated extraction. And they have been able historically to do so because of lower environmental demands, I would say, to, to some extent. But in recent years, some other countries have come in and started producing. But China maintains a tight control of the value chain downstream. And why is this important? Well, some of these rare earths are used in permanent magnets. And that is really what is driving demand because permanent magnets are used in the green transformation 
Here we see the example of wind turbines. They're used in the generators there. And Europe is leading the decarbonization and we're doing uh, everything we can to make a green transformation. Another big use area is in electrical vehicles, in the motors, to be able to access the energy from the battery packs. So what, what can we do then? Well, we have the possibility to innovate and to use circular methods of extraction from our primary production of iron ore. As said, we produce six, uh, 27 million tons of iron ore products every year. From that we get mine tailings, and part of that is appetite. And the first step, we will then produce an appetite concentrate uh, that we will then transport by the uh, railway with electrified locomotives down to Luleå, the port side where we're planning for a circular industrial park, and where we will then dissolve the uh, appetite concentrate and produce the main product in our process, which is phosphoric acid. That can be used in different industries like steel, food, battery production even, but we're looking at uh, further processing this uh, with ammonia to create a uh, mineral fertilizer product, so decreasing Europe's uh, reliance on external sourcing for this. This is uh, known technology. What is not is the uh, part where we then also extract the other mineralizations. Typically, other mineralizations are either put, put uh, away as deposits or follow along with the mineral fertilizer. We are aiming to also extract and separate the fluorine and the rare earth elements as an oxide concentrate, meaning it's a mix of all uh, rare earths in our ores. We also ha have uh, our own production of feed materials uh, and chemicals, so when we then regenerate the acid that we use, we also uh, create a new byproduct, gypsum, uh, uh, which we aim to produce as a commercial grade, replacing virgin mining. So, we're really trying to avoid uh, new deposits, create new uh, products for uh, European markets. We are at the end of our feasibility study, so we've done technical studies, we have done public consultation process, and are now entering uh, the permit uh, during the coming years and doing the detailed engineering and starting construction uh, is planned for 24 with start of production in 2027. It's not all the, up to us, of course. There is permitting that is needed. And here we have uh, the example of the Circle Industrial Park that will need its permits, but it goes upstream to our mining sites as well. There we need extension permits for this operation, even though it is uh, a byproduct from existing operations. It needs additional permits. That is something we see as risks in this project. Last week, we announced a very interesting news as well. Uh, if you remember the value chain for rare earths, uh, we're producing oxide concentrate, but Europe needs more capacity to refine and separate. And last week we announced that we invested in and became the largest uh, owner of a company called Retech. Uh, and the idea here is that we will be producing our appetite concentrate by our mine sites, take that down to the circular industry park in Luleå. And from there, we will take our rare earth oxide concentrate to Norway for retex facility that will be up and running already by the end of 24, where they have a proprietary new technology for separation of rare earth elements with up to 90% lower CO2 emissions. So by this investment, we have secured European capacity to separate rare earth elements and the foundation of a strong Nordic and European value chain all the way from mine to market. And looking at how much can we supply? Well, we have the capacity to supply more than five times the needs of Sweden's phosphorus and 30% of today's imports of REEs. But of course, demand is growing rapidly. So when we get to market, that uh, perhaps it will be a bit different, but still, if you look at the blue bars here, you see how I see there's something wrong with the numbers here. It's supposed to be 0.3 to 0.6% in the blue bars. <laughs> um, and uh, that goes to show how much phosphorus is in our mining ores. Very low in comparison. So that is quite clear. You can't do this as a primary production. It needs to be a secondary production on the back of the uh, iron ore production. And when it comes to REEs, of course, those are even lower numbers. 
So those need to be on the back of the phosphorus production. But we also see a capacity to increase beyond this uh, existing operations, both looking at technical and uh, exploration studies of the old tailings, but also at new mines. And we have uh, reported uh, our exploration results for a new ore body called Per Geier, named after the exploration geologist that discovered it. And that is up to eight times higher phosphorus content as compared with the Kiruna mine, as an example. So that means if we're able to mine that, we, we could potentially replace all of Russia's imports to Europe, which would be of a very big significance. We have not reported REs in that new ore body yet. That is something we aim to do next year. But what we've seen historically is there is a very close co correlation between the phosphorus and REs. So we expect to uh, be able to report significant volumes of REs as well. David, that's a very interesting presentation and a very promising project indeed with some like, really exciting uh, milestones ahead. If I can ask maybe a quick follow-up mm -hmm. question. Uh, what do you think that has been the, the biggest regulatory challenge in developing the project so far? What would you think? I would say uh, it goes back to the permits of the mine sites. Mm -hmm. That has been historically challenging. Uh, and to be clear, we're not looking for lower demands in, in our permits, by no means. Mm -hmm. High demands is a benefit for us. It helps us with competitiveness and showing that we, we are a leading player. But we need transparency predictability and efficient, quick processes, whereby everybody knows what is expected so we can meet those requirements. Thank you very much, David. And from David, I'm moving to David <laughs> uh, on my other side uh, with the European Commission. Um, David, could you tell us m a little bit more about what the European Commission is, is doing to tackle these dependencies and, and the role of the EU Science Hub in particular in, uh, in addressing uh, the issue that's bringing us together on critical raw materials and rare earth elements. Yeah, maybe I take a step back first and just sort of introduce a little bit um, the commission and the structure and who's doing what, and then um, go into a little bit the role of the, the Joint Research Center for, for whom I actually uh, work. So at, at the European Commission level, which is one of the, the European bodies. Um, basically we have several what are called director generals so departments that, that support this, this topic and these activities. Um, I'd say some of the main ones obviously are, are linked to trade like DG Trade, you've got DG Grow linked to industry and, and enterprise and then um, others, uh, DG Environment which is playing a large role from, from the, the circular economy perspective. Um, and also, of course, all, all the other DGs that are focused on, on specific uh, sectors, etc., um, like linked to energy, defense and space, um, etc., and also agriculture that was mentioned earlier and, and the long, strong link with phosphorus and the, the relationships there. Um, then, on, on kind of um, supporting those and, and linked more to sort of knowledge and intelligence bodies like uh, research and innovation but also the the commission's joint research center so the joint research center is one of the largest dgs and basically provides knowledge and science-based support to the commission so uh, our role in that that sense is is to really provide information both through analysis of what's the current situation but also as far as possible, looking forward, so with forecasting, foresight work, and th things like this. So th this is this is what we're doing. Um, one of the big developments, I would say, in in the the knowledge area and knowledge support was the the mandate to develop the raw materials information system in in 2015. That's part of the circular economy action plan, and um, so we, we're quite advanced with that now it's it's quite a nice up and running system it will go into its third phase next year so it's it's um it's it's kind of gone through its childhood you mm -hmm. know it's um, starting to, to to sort of have proper fruit and looking at forecasting so we we're obviously not the only organization but we're looking at knowledge and information linked to raw materials minerals extraction processing also secondary raw materials and so forth um, 
but we are we are pretty much the interface at the EU level between the the European level policy and the the community, so the member states, the the research community, business, and and so forth, trying to bring this information together, um, have some sort of coherence, quality assurance. And then in a lot of these studies, supporting a lot of these um, analyses for what kind of uh, demand there will be in different sectors in the future, so both in the near term and the long term. Um, some of the sectors that were mentioned linked to renewable energies, linked to electric vehicles, linked to digitalization, uh, linked to batteries, of course. That, that's a, a major interest to sort of promote the the battery industry as well as the renewable energy industry and so forth mm -hmm. in, in Europe. So to, to, in some cases, bring these industries back into to, to the EU and uh, have these value chains. So the, the project that, that's mentioned um, from LKAB is, is, is quite an important one in that sense to, to sort of not just bring back the extraction phase, but also the, 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 the processing phase and have the whole value mm -hmm. chain. And ultimately, as we want to see uh, circularity as well in terms of the circular economy, so to, to have more of these things recycled, reused, um, but not just the bulk materials like iron and steel and so forth, but really these, these tiny uh, metals and minerals that, that we sometimes call critical raw materials, mm -hmm. where we have a lot of reliance on uh, China, uh, on Russia, on, on many other countries. Um, also, also, even some some EU countries, you know, we have single producers of certain things in some cases from mm -hmm. the EU. So it, it's not just external realizers. So this is a little bit the the the, the general picture and the drivers. Um, as you said, the president in the State of the Union speech for 2020 highlighted this issue. Um, it it it's been a long-standing issue. The the Commission has produced every three years a list of critical remote raw materials for like the last 12 years or so um, and we're at a, a list of about 30 critical raw materials at the moment mm -hmm. um, there's other materials of concern from a sort of responsible sourcing perspective things like this S so um, these these are a little bit challenges um, and what the president also announced was was the critical raw materials act and, and that's going to be a very important uh, package that's, that's due early next year. So there's a lot of uh, work going on to, to basically push, push ahead um, to, to reduce our reliance on critical raw materials, uh, well, to make them less critical, basically, but also to, to push ahead with things like having a level playing field. Um, so it was mentioned, you know, and I think with this, this project as well, that's also been highlighted here, one, one of the issues will be the, the economic side of it. Mm. Um, so this, this is a, a super promising project and hopefully one of many. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that expands. And, and the concept has been pushed through research and innovation for, for quite some while to look at, at mining tailings and wastes and, and to... to to try to commercialize that and to move to these these um, other products that, that come from that, that are not the main products, but, but side mm -hmm. products. Um, so that, that's one of the aims. But this level playing field also was mentioned um, to re really sort of make sure that uh, in the EU we have products on the market that have certain environmental and social standards linked to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, but not to the, just the product itself, but taking into account what's called its full life cycle, so the full value chain. So the extraction, the processing, etc., are done in a certain manner that's um, environmentally appropriate and also uh, promotes, let's say, uh, improved social conditions and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, including in countries outside of the EU, but, uh, but also in the EU. And so we, we, we shouldn't see this kind of... Um, commercial advantage, let's say, of, of products coming into the EU that are produced with, with poorer standards um, that, that may, maybe would uh, impact some of these projects and their commercial viability. Mm -hmm. So this, this is pretty much mm -hmm. yeah. well, David, thank you very much. I believe we still have a, a minute for a, for a follow-up question. Um, perhaps um, you've been talking about how your division has been uh, forecasting all these this needs and, 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 and 
perhaps more, more specific sectors. How do you think the ongoing Russian war in Ukraine has, has impacted this, this forecast? Uh, well, f firstly, I mean, the, the, um, you, you've had various events, obviously, we've had recently uh, COVID, uh, which, which had big impacts on value chains, um, mm -hmm. not just for metals and minerals. So this, this right. brought to light the whole, the whole reliance of the EU and the problem which we knew about to some degree, but we were quite comfortable, I would say, as EU um, moving ahead with that situation and these strong reliances on countries like China and so forth. Um, then you had the Suez Canal incident, which also uh, created value chain problems. But then recently, of course, um, and we've done a lot of analysis ourselves on that, you, you had the, the invasion of Ukraine. And... Um, you know, that brought to light as well a lot of the reliances, for for example, on phosphorus on, on Russia. Mm. Um, you have reliances on Belarus. And also, of course, you had impacts on the, the production itself and the shipping and so forth from, from U Ukraine itself. So um, th there's a lot of materials, um, also uh, gases, neon and so forth, where... where um, this this invasion has has um, created a lot of problems um, and not necessarily sort of blocking or banning certain materials coming to the EU but but the restrictions on transport on the the financial mm -hmm. markets and things that that stop the trade um, has a big impact um, in in terms of um, getting these these materials and in, in some case, Things like tungsten and so forth that are vital for, for aerospace and defense. So, so there's quite some, some, some large impacts. Um, so the forecast and analyses, um, we are obviously had to, to do a lot of rapid response in, in this case because uh, sometimes, you know, in, in the research world, we're, we're quite used to sort of being remote from, from mm. places like Brussels and sort of sitting back and analyzing things and taking that time to do it properly. Um, so there's been a lot of pressure, of, of course, to come up with uh, analyses into different materials and what are alternative sources. Um, and those forecasts are very much based on what's already um, foreseen, let's say, in, in the pipeline um, mm -hmm. from different projects and plans. So, And th this kind of project, of course, um, uh, vastly improves the situation, you mm -hmm. know, in, in terms of the forecasts and shifting towards more European mm -hmm. um, um, supply chains and value chains that, that counter a little bit this, this problem of uh, heavy reliance on certain countries and, and mm -hmm. uh, high risks uh, that, mm -hmm. that go with that. Mm -hmm. If anything, the, the ongoing context and the current situation has made more, that, more evident the need to address and to tackle these, these dependencies, uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, David. Now, we'll, we'd like to hear from our uh, last one of our speakers, of our panelists uh, today. It's uh, Kari Harlevi, Head of Unit for Global Affairs at Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund. Uh, Kari, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, the role of raw materials in uh, sustainable value chains in order to ensure uh, Europe's green growth. Thank you and greetings from Helsinki, Finland. So very interesting discussion so far. So just briefly about CITRA, Finnish uh, Innovation Fund under the Finnish Parliament. Uh, we have been pushing about uh, the circular economy for several years, uh, not only in Finland, but internationally. And uh, of course, uh, raw materials are in the core of discussions many times when we talk about the circular economy. And definitely all, all the reasons that uh, the previous panelists have stated about the current geopolitical situation, of course, are kind of uh, increasing the role of circular economy in, in many debates and, and, and also in the uh, R&D work of many companies that what we have also heard today. One of the key things, of course, that is that we have those raw materials and, and, and the, the key kind of uh, reason is that we want to achieve the Paris goals. And, uh, and one of the challenges, of course, is the availability of those raw materials uh, in, in a speedy fashion. But at, at the same time, they have to be, of course, ecologically uh, sourced uh, materials. And, uh, I think these are the reasons why we have to look at the, the, the system as a whole uh, and, and, and kind of uh, not make only individual choices here, but uh, kind of uh, design 
circular economy systems, especially. And, and when I think about the, the current uh, debates uh, and discussions, uh, one of the interesting research from Finland was just uh, published last year by the Geological Survey of Finland. And, uh, and, and there it was very much um, stated that uh, countries have to make decisive and fast actions to really to, to uh, diversify the, the sourcing of materials, but, but also kind of uh, investing in different technologies and, uh, and, and uh, by that uh, speed up the development. But uh, I would also like to stress here that uh, it's, it's also about uh, kind of uh, um, uh, the, the individual choices uh, of, of behavioral and, and the, the kind of uh, uh, citizen level engagement as, as well, how we actually we are used to, to consume. And, and those are the reasons why I think that uh, we are really uh, in the need of having a better uh, design, uh, better circular economy actions. And, and uh, this is not like a regional country level uh, specific question. It's, it's really about uh, global view. And I'd like to say also that in that respect, the European Union's uh, goals uh, when it comes to critical raw material act is, is very much in line with what I also see what is needed. I would like to maybe at this point also point out that uh, uh, international cooperation and trade policies are, are something that is, is very much linked to the raw materials. And uh, in, in that sense, uh, uh, like-minded partners uh, with the European Union uh, are, are really needed. And um, one of the key things uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the International Energy Agency's recommendation, recommendations was that uh, we should scale up recycling. And uh, that's something that uh, is certainly needed, but it's, it's not the only solution here. We have to also diversify uh, the, the sourcing, but also uh, come up with uh, technologies that actually could improve the current situation. And, and it, one, one thing, just a final point from the kind of circular economy point of view is that uh, data and material traceability are crucial when we talk about these circular measures. And, and uh, for those reasons, uh, for example, digital product passports are, are enabling factors to, to kind of push circular economy forward. And um, just a final point, which I think is fascinating, is that uh, different companies are kind of now cross-innovating. Uh, For example, Finnish um, company known Fortum, it's an energy corporation, but they have been now investing a lot of uh, in circular economy and, and providing solutions to how to uh, capture uh, metals uh, from the lithium-ion batteries. And, and of course, companies see this as a great opportunity to build their businesses uh, and but but also kind of uh, look at the different uh, industrial surpluses like in the Fortum's case uh, they also look at uh, the, the kind of manufacturing of batteries and how can they can uh, provide uh, recycling services for industrial surpluses uh, just a final uh, note here is that uh, we have established the World Circular Economy Forum that is one of the leading platforms in circular economy and uh, in, in uh, coming forums uh, this topic certainly will be one of the most important uh, as we go along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kari Harlevi. We still have perhaps a couple of minutes for, for another uh, follow-up question for you. You were mentioning the critical raw materials act as a, as a positive uh, step forward. What do you think that the act should uh, really take into account and should really uh, reflect? What are your thoughts? Well, I would start maybe by, by saying that, uh, of course, the principles of circularity has to be very much in the core of, of those uh, discussions and, uh, and plans. And, and, and definitely it's, it's about uh, also about reducing material use to a certain extent and, uh, and, and by increasing also the resource efficiency through uh, different circular economy design principles as, as well. And uh, when it comes to kind of, uh, let's say, from the kind of uh, downstream activities, of course, we have to find ways to create a value from waste as, as, as well. So, so, so there will be obviously waste in the future, but we have to kind of make sure that that comes to kind of uh, uh, fair use in the, in the future. 
Uh, I, I think those are maybe some of the, the, the uh, most important uh, uh, parts, but as mentioned, uh, um, the trade policies are also important part and, and how to make those kind of uh, sustainable in the future as, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This helps us transition very nicely to our next, perhaps, part of the discussion. We would like to hear your thoughts and, uh, and your opinions. We have a poll on Slido. You can access through it via the hashtag uh, COP27 Brussels, in which we would like to ask you your thoughts. Do we need to really ensure like our dependence on uh, European, uh, to ensure our production, regional production of rare earth elements or or trade agreements are still going to play an important role in all the parts of the world. So we have our poll with us. There's this uh, statement. There's no green transition without European rare earth elements production. And the options are that's true, that there will be no competition of supply and potential conflicts if we don't ensure uh, regional production. You can also say that you don't know. And false trade agreements will ensure supply from other parts of the world. We'll leave you a couple of seconds to put forward your responses. And we seem to have a clear winner, but we'll let the other two catch up. Let's take a couple more seconds to those of you who have just logged into Slido. All right, I think we have a clear uh, winner here. I think the vast majority of you, more than 70% of you agree that it's true that there is no green transition without European rare earth elements productions. There will be competition of supply and potential conflicts if we don't ensure regional production. And for that, I would like to hear your, your thoughts and perhaps also have a first round of reactions uh, among speakers. Uh, I don't know if, if David, David, you'd like to start. What do you think of uh, of these results and is there anything in the discussion that have perhaps sparked uh, uh, your attention? Well, I think this shows what David talked about earlier when we talk about critical raw materials and uh, perhaps previously we've had a theoretical understanding of risks and why we had a critical raw material list. But we've ex we did accept that situation and it wasn't a real risk until COVID uh, uh, and uh, the, the logistic crisis and the Ukraine, then everything became very real. I think that has changed the, the political and the general societal perspective on this need. And, and I think coming up to that, then I saw we got a question here, here from me on LKB's key policy recommendations for the CRM Act as well. Uh, the, the first list pu published contained, was it 14 critical raw materials? Uh, so that has more than doubled in nine years. And that begs the question, are we good at defining what is critical in advance? <laughs> it seems that we're looking at historical uh, things here. And, and knowing that Europe is generally import dependent on most raw materials, and we see that even though it's not a critical, if it's a standard mineral or metal, any kind of shortfall or, 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 or uh, loss of production capacity will have huge implications on our industry and production capacity. So, and with our example, uh, that iron ore is not on that list, but the iron ore production is also an import dependency, even though we produce a lot for Europe. But it's also that uh, production that will enable us to actually produce critical raw materials of phosphorus and REEs. So I think there is a methodology question we could discuss here. How do we define that? How do we ensure that Europe is more self-sustained generally in raw materials? Because that can be the key to unlocking critical raw materials as well. Thank you, mm. Thank you David. Uh, David, any reactions to either the poll or what other speakers have said or uh, uh, David's uh, statement? Yeah, a lot to swallow. I mean, of, obviously the the Critical Raw Materials Act at the moment is in, in drafting, so um, it, it would be far from my position to, to give a formal statement about what will be in there or not. Um, but many of the elements have been highlighted today, um, including the circularity aspects, but also the level playing field, the necessity to, to promote value chains within the EU. Um, 
and the partnerships as well, which, which uh, Ursula von der Leyen highlighted also in her 2020 speech and where we've just seen in COP27, in fact, uh, two, two new ones signed with Kazakhstan and with, with uh, Namibia. So, and we expect further ones. Uh, there, there's a partnership in place with Ukraine, in fact, um, that was signed before the invasion and also with, with other like-minded countries such as Canada and so forth. Um, in, in terms of criticality, uh, so I, I can obviously say, I mean, the, 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 there's different countries and regions that have their own methodologies. In, in Europe, we have a certain approach. Um, it is a retroactive assessment, so, and we have seen it move over the years from, from what was called 14 critical raw materials up to 30 now. Um, so, so that's a, a worsening problem. Um, there's also a certain definition with that, so we have to be a little bit careful. So when you say, well, iron isn't, isn't included, um, there's a reason because critical is, is fairly well defined as some a material that's coming from a limited number of, of countries. So not companies even, but countries. Um, we also look at the governance of those countries in that kind of risk factor, you could call it. And also that those materials play a, a key, key role in different economic sectors in Europe. So um, to what extent they contribute. So this is kind of two axes. One, one is the, the supply risk. One is the economic importance, uh, which, which are very simplified approaches, of course. It's, it's almost a screening method. That goes into making the decision what the list is. Um, so it's not the ultimate, you know, it's, it's not kind of push a button and you get the list. It's, um, there's an analysis and then a lot of information that takes several years that's proposed. But that's, that's looking back. Um, what happened in 2020, uh, critical raw materials assessment was, was we were asked uh, by, by colleagues in DG Grow for the JRC to conduct a foresight report, um, looking at certain key sectors um, which included transport, um, so batteries, renewable energies, but also a little bit touching on defense and space and so forth already at the time. Um, and to look forward and, and to see what would be the future demand relative to the supply. And, and things like rare earths, of course, were, were, were clear, but the, there's a lot of other materials in there. Um, so, so iron per se, because it's got a lot a lot of different suppliers to the EU and so forth is quite diversified in that sense. But it, it doesn't mean it's not a super important material. And also the importance, as you say, is because it's, it's a, a, a main product. But then these little materials and metals that we're, we're so reliant on to have digitalization, to have low carbon economy, um, are also byproducts of, of that. So we, without those main products. And, and going back to the question, I mean, f firstly, I would say it's not just about rare earths. As we see, we've got a list of 30 critical raw materials, so it, it's much broader than that. And going into the future, we have to be careful that that list doesn't keep growing. Um, and, and one of this, the, the ways um, is, is to, to bring this kind of extraction and production in a sustainable manner back in, into the EU. Um, so this act will, will, will largely focus on things like that how to push that ahead, as well as partnerships outside of the EU and so forth. Thanks, David. Uh, Karihar Levy, anything that you would like to add to, to this discussion? What do you think about the, the poll results or what David and David uh, have uh, also mentioned? Yeah, yeah, I think the poll really showed that uh, these kind of uh, challenging times that we are living in uh, really brings these kind of uh, dependencies in the forefront and uh, that, that, that's why it, it is a good opportunity also to kind of uh, really evaluate uh, how we are actually producing and consumption. Uh, and and uh, one thing that I was thinking of was that um, obviously circular economy is needed in Europe, uh, uh, but uh, it's obviously a global value chain play many ways and uh, we shouldn't also kind of lose uh, the kind of uh, let's say, open market perspective and, and uh, rule-based international trading uh, kind of benefits that we have had so far. So 
for example, I was in Australia two weeks ago, and um, definitely the, the kind of um, discussions are very much in the forefront also in Asia Pacific in many ways. So, so just to highlight that, that uh, we should also kind of uh, consider and look the, the kind of uh, wider, more, more than European perspective here as, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much to our members of the audience. Remember that you can still ask questions via Slido. We still have just about uh, 10 minutes left before we wrap up the discussion. So we'll try to uh, answer to as many of them as possible. So don't be shy, keep them coming and we'll try to, uh, to answer them. I have a question for, uh, I'm assuming it's David Pennington. Uh, which says, uh, when do you think the EU will be independent from outside markets? Are we ever going to be independent? What, what, are you, what's your, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm not sure if I <laughs> have more personal thoughts on that, but um, I, I don't think that's at all the aim. And I, I think what was, was just mentioned, just highlighted, was uh, the importance of trade and working together. And um, so it's, it's not to be uh, independent Europe per se. Uh, Diversification is still important also outside of the EU. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we need our own supplies. We, we, lead, we lead markets globally in certain areas, but in other areas we're reliant. And these, these trade exchanges are extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen that build up with the EU with the single market. So it's, it's, it's not a closed uh, system and it's not aiming to be that. Um, but on the other hand, we've, we've, we've got to reduce supply risks um, and, and things like you. Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, have, have highlighted the, the heavy risks that we have, that, mm -hmm. that we knew about and we, we sort of lived with. Um, but I, I believe with this, this thing, the, the Critical Raw Materials Act and so forth, um, the, this, this, this cannot be an acceptable situation any further. It's, it's got to be addressed and to reduce those risks. But diversification is also a way of reducing that mm -hmm. and uh, international trade and so forth. Definitely. Thanks, David. Uh, maybe I would like to turn to uh, David for another question on REE map. Um, as we have been, as we've seen earlier, uh, I think the project really has the potential of addressing many of uh, many of these dependencies and be really a game changer. So, do you think is there a way? How would it be possible to apply a successful, let's say, um, follow up or like model of REE map across across Europe? Do you think? What do you think would be needed to be able to replicate um, such a project in, in other parts of Europe? But where do you see the potential there? Well, first, of course, there is a lot of exploration work needed. We need to know what we have in types of resources in both virgin mining and in potentials such as we are looking into in secondary products from existing mining or revisiting old tailings. I think those are key. If we don't know what's there, we can't make educated decisions. And, and there is, to some extent, a fear of allowing exploration because then some will argue, well, there's a, a, a fear of that it will become a mining and extraction there. And then we get into the not in my backyard fears and discussions. But I think if we don't have a very good understanding of what's available, we can't make the best choices. And I do think that we have an obligation in Europe to take responsibility for extracting because we are using the materials but we're not doing the extraction and we have the capacity to do it in a sustainable way and we have those ambitions regulations that foster that kind of situation so, so it is a, a really an ethical moral responsibility as well if, if we want to use the resources and have the green transformation Coming into this, I think there is an element that is being discussed in the CRM Act of overriding public interest because there will be different interests uh, that will be opposite of each other here. Uh, th that's a discussion we need to have here. What is society accepting? Do we want to accept reliance on, on uh, states like Russia and China and the risks of not getting supply to Europe and the risks that, that that poses for a European auto industry, wind industry? Or are we saying, no, there's another way. We can do it sustainably here. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is what the industry, our, our customers are wanting, definitely. Otherwise, they won't feel secure. And oh, yes, trade will, will be important. But if you look at the, the soaring demand that is projected, 
there will be an undersupply of neodymium and praseodymium, as an example, even in, uh, if we include all known prospects. And then you see different kind of policies coming from our friendly countries as well that will, will uh, drive demand and steer supply towards those regions. So even among these, there will, will be a competition uh, as there is an undersupply. And I think every European auto manufacturer will be interested to secure European supply. Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, maybe uh, Kari Karlevi would like to, uh, to react to it or maybe David would want to add something afterwards. Um, Sure, sure. I was also thinking that uh, from the European perspective, the case that was presented today, the LKAB's uh, Circular Industrial Park uh, approach, um, I, I think there could be a possibilities to kind of, um, if possible, to kind of um, not, not replicate, but that these kind of models behind uh, are maybe usable in, in some other parts of Europe as, as well. Why I'm saying this is that uh, we have funded not so far away from Lula, from in the in the Finnish side, Kemitornios Industrial Park um, development, uh, and and scale that to different parts in Finland, and I think um, this kind of uh, model approach could be useful, uh, as I heard about the, the approach that the company has. So, so just a kind of maybe point to some some stakeholders that are looking the kind of European development in, in the industrial part of uh, circular economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David, is there anything you'd like to, to add? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it, it, it's already been well stated that the, there's a interest and a need to, to bring activities uh, stronger back into Europe on extraction and processing. Um, there's also the societal challenge that you, you mentioned, that um, there's got to be an understanding or a better understanding that the, the products that are consumed, um, so vehicles, e electricity itself, uh, mobile phones and so forth, are linked to, to these materials. So, the, you, you know, um, you, you cannot be blind to the production of these and that um, they've got to come from somewhere. And I think that everybody is starting to realize that that's got to be done also in a sustainable manner. They cannot come from somewhere irrespective of the environmental and social conditions they're, they're, they're produced from. Um, the, there is another element that we've not really talked about much that's super important as well, is, is uh, resource efficiency. So it's, it's not sort of saying let's, let's go back to the, the sort of caveman era and the dark ages, but. Um, but producing products uh, using resources in, in a kind of a more efficient manner, um, consuming in, in a better way as well, mm -hmm. of course, more sustainably, um, and also looking for alternatives. So exploration was mentioned for, for extraction, that's, that's super important, of course. Um, but also how can we improve uh, processes along the value chain in terms of um, sustainable performance, particularly environmental and social performance, um, and the products themselves. And there you start to see things like product environmental footprints uh, that account for the full life cycle of the products uh, from the extraction stages right to the product itself, and then obviously the end of life, what happens to that where do the materials go, the circularity aspects. Um, so I think we will start to see also an increase in um, the l waste legislation to, to basically start to promote not just the recycling of, of steel and aluminium and things like this, the bulk materials, but, but also these, these um, smaller critical materials, how to extract them. And a lot more research and innovation mm -hmm. as well at all the stages. So, for example, for, the, for this project, um, you, you rely a lot on modern techniques, um, a lot on sort of a, a more ro robots digitalization, um, also to have improved environmental performance and efficiencies and so forth. Um, so, at every stage of, of the life cycle, you, you will need this kind of research and innovation. Um, to, to improve the operations and to make them more energy efficient yeah. and, and so forth. 
Thank you very much, David. And with, with these words, I think it's time to wrap up the discussion. I think it's been a very interesting, really, I believe, exciting one. And I believe we've also left uh, some, some more topics, some more questions that we could have discussed uh, on the side. But I, I think we are all aligned and we are all clear that uh, there's a European need to, to tackle these dependencies, to speed up uh, regional production. We are seeing uh, some uh, very interesting, very exciting and promising projects coming to 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 the surface uh, right now, and uh, it also gives the opportunity to be doing so in a sustainable uh, manner, which is, I think, what we are looking for at the end of the day. So, I would like to thank you very much to all of our speakers, to David Hagnelit, to David Pennington, and to Kari Harlevi, who have uh, the three of you uh, joined us in uh, in this morning at this uh, virtual side event at, of COP27 here in Brussels. And to thank to all of you in the audience who have participated in the discussions, who have submitted your questions. We wish you a great rest of the day and thanks a lot for having been with us. See you next time. And in order to end uh, this uh, event hosted by LKAB, we would like to introduce one uh, last uh, video. So thank you very much and until next time. Thank mm -hmm. In our everyday life, minerals are all around us. Some we're hardly even aware of, like fluorine in small medical applications, or neodymium in magnets for electrical vehicles or wind turbines. With a growing population, the demand for minerals is higher than ever. At LKAB, we have accepted this challenge. These critical raw materials that we need come from down here. And through new technology in the REMAP project, we aim to prove that mining waste can become an important asset to the world's needs without emitting unnecessary carbon dioxide. By establishing a large-scale industrial park and using innovative technology, we will extract valuable resources from the tailings sand. Rare earth elements, gypsum, fluorine, and perhaps most importantly, phosphorus. Without it, global agricultural production would be halved. All of this will be produced with hydro and wind energy. We can't single-handedly solve the world's need for critical raw materials, but this will certainly make a very important contribution. LKAB already operates some of the most climate-efficient mines on the planet. But now we're starting yet another ambitious journey. To turn today's waste into tomorrow's resources.